primary interest is in melanoma, using melanoma as a model for cancer as a whole. And what we've learned from melanoma, because it's a very good model system to study cancers, we can, because we can see all stages of the disease. We can see normal pigment cells, it's a skin cancer, it's one of the most dangerous forms of skin cancer. We can see normal pigment cells in the skin. We can see as the cancer progresses, it's starting to spread across the surface of the skin, then it starts to invade, and then it ultimately forms metastases that, that can kill people. And the advantage of melanoma is we can see all stages of the disease. And we understand a lot about how the origins of it. We know it comes about primarily because of ultraviolet irradiation. In addition, one of the other key advances in melanoma in recent years is the identification of a gene which is mutated. It's like the accelerator, it's the gene that pushes cells to divide in an uncontrolled way. It's called BRAF. And some years ago, in 2002, in uh, Cambridge in England, that gene was first discovered as to be activated in about 50% of melanomas. Within 10 years, there were drugs targeting specifically the activated form. They have very dramatic effects on the, the response in, in the patients. So you can see a patient with multiple metastases in, spread all over the body that will respond incredibly well to a BRAF inhibitor. But what happens inevitably is there's resistance that will develop within a, a few months. And the question is why does resistance develop and what can we do about it? What is learned is that within each metastasis there may be different mechanisms of resistance. Even within the same metastasis there may be multiple mechanisms of resistance and this means that by the time, time the patient gets a relapse, the, the disease reappears after an apparently successful treatment, there are so many different mechanisms of resistance it becomes very difficult to treat. So the question now is, well, what are, the are there mechanisms of resistance that are potentially amenable to therapy? And one of the things we realize is that though many of the mechanisms of resistance are genetic, the patient starts to get more and more genetic lesions, some of which give rise to drug resistance. Within each tumor within the patient, there are certain what we call phenotypic populations, populations of cells which may have the same genetic background but which have fundamentally different biological properties. So some may be more differentiated, reflecting the tissue of origin, in this case, more pigmented cells. Some will be uh, proliferating, and those give rise to the tumor getting enlarging. Some become invasive and start to see new metastases, and some may become dormant, so that even after a successful therapy, the same disease may reappear many years later. So we're especially interested in how it is that those particular phenotypic states, those different subpopulations, perhaps with the same genetic background, how do they occur? We know that a principal component of their establishment is the influence of the microenvironment. So different parts of the tumor may have more or less oxygen, more or less nutrient availability. Signals from the immune system may affect the way the cells behave. And all those signals may cause some cells to switch from being proliferative, actively dividing, to slowing down proliferation and migrating away, eventually to establish new, new tumors. So the question we have is, can we manipulate those different phenotypic subpopulations in a way that's independent of the genetics for therapeutic benefit? And we know that for many uh, melanomas, Drug resistance is primarily mediated by uh, phenotypic subpopulation. There are certain phenotypic states associated with uh, invasiveness especially that can be both resistant to targeted therapies, therapies targeting BRAF for example, but also resistant as we've shown to, to the more recent therapies that are targeting what are so-called immune checkpoints. And so understanding how those phenotypic states are established turns out to be really important. And the ultimate goal is to be able to take a drug or immunotherapy resistant phenotypic state, use a small molecule drug and convert that cell to become now sensitive to drugs that may be less targeting a specific molecule, but more that you're, you're targeting cells which are um, have general properties. So they could be, you switch from a non-proliferating invasive cell towards a proliferating cell and you target it with now something that kills dividing cells. 
or something that now makes it sensitive to immunotherapy, which is operating independent of the genetics of the disease. So in our lab we've been especially interested over recent years, why is it that any cell becomes invasive? Why does any cell move away from the primary tumor to form a new colony? And we've been following especially the, the rules of evolution because we know that almost certainly the first cell that ever moved in evolution, maybe 3,000 million years ago, moved because movement gave a, a more efficient way to assimilate nutrients from the microenvironment. And you know that from single cell organisms, from bacteria, from yeast, from fungi, invasion is a consequence of starvation. And what we've been able to show in the last uh, year or so is that the same is true in melanoma and is almost certainly true in other cancers in that invasion is a response to a fundamental mechanism that imposes a starvation state on cells. Now, sometimes that can be imposed by nutrient limitation within the tumor, so cells are growing in an uncontrolled way, they, they deplete nutrients in the vicinity and that may induce them to activate a mechanism to go and seek nutrients elsewhere. The other way this might work is that signals from infiltrating immune cells, hypoxia, there's a whole range of signals which are not directly related to starvation, but which can impose what we call a pseudo-starvation state. So there may be plenty of nutrients around, but these other signals, like TNF-alpha or TGF-beta, which are associated with inflammation, can engage the same starvation mechanism within the cell, and that then induces cells to start moving. So, in terms of understanding, what we now know is that invasion uh, means that cells engage this, this starvation mechanism and that when they start proliferating to form a new metastasis, they de-engage that and switch back to proliferation again, right? When there's plenty of nutrients and an absence of these pseudo-starvation signals. So then the question comes, well, what can we, how can we use this for therapeutic benefit? And one of the things you might imagine doing, so this is still an early stage, is in cells survive starvation, survive these stresses and pseudo-starvation signals, by shutting down a lot of their, their machinery that's required to build new cells. And that, that enables them to survive. So essentially they become so-called slow cycling cells that are better able to initiate tumors, that are better able to survive in the body un, under all sorts of other stresses. And once they survive, of course, then they have the potential in the future to switch back, start proliferating again and form new tumors. So you can imagine ways in which their survival is dependent on shutting down this so-called anabolic metabolism, the, the, the processes required to build new cells. They have to shut that down in order to survive. Just like if we starve, we tend to, to do less work and so on. We start to digest whatever excess we've got. We start to do. So it's a, it's a bit like cells then go on to a, um, an anorexic mode where they, they try to close down and match their nutrient supply and demand. So one way you can imagine in the future of dealing with these invasive cells is trying to increase their nutrient demand. To trick them into thinking that actually these stress signals which have, have shut down their capacity to build new cells, make them think those stress signals have gone away, reactivate their process of building new cells, and then they will die because now their, their demand now greatly exceeds supply to those cells. So the whole reason that cells survive under stress is they match, they decrease demand in order to match decreased supply of nutrients or, or adjust their, their behavior in, in response to whatever stresses they're encountering. If we can make the cell think that the stresses have gone away but the stresses are actually still there, then we can find ways to kill them. And this is something that we're following up in my lab and in collaboration with many other labs worldwide. And in particular here in Brazil, we have a collaboration with Silvia Stucci Engler. We published a, jointly published a paper primarily from Silvia's lab last year where we helped out in analyzing how some of the genes that she's interested in affect these particular phenotypic states in response to 
in, in cells which have become adapted to be drug resistant. And that was published last year and of course next year one of the things we want to follow up with this is to ask more questions about how these drug resistant uh, states are established and so she will send one of the people from her uh, lab, the, funded by FAPESPI, to my lab uh, to do a couple of years in the lab looking at exactly how this so-called nutrient supply demand model impacts melanoma progression. Music